Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. You know, that's, you know, you can almost stop right there. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You know when that happens, I almost want to repent because I didn't ask you to stand. So I forgive me, Lord. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand... Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert, and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me, that whenever I speak, words may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly, as I should. Amen. You may be seated. And obviously, I want to lift out that short phrase in the second part of verse 14, but um, tack it on to the first couple of words because it includes that, is stand firm then with the breastplate of righteousness in place. And so the title of my message this morning is Active Righteousness. Just in in the interest of a a running start, uh, it's good always for there to be a A little bit of a review, not a lot, I hope not a lot, Um, but we do this for a couple of reasons. Obviously, um, uh, we want to reinforce truth, um, and we learn through repetition, and um, and want to maybe continue to uh, inspire or invest this truth into your hearts over and over and over again, because we are really embarking on a very, very serious uh, issue and concern, because you know, the devil is very much alive and very active, and I think more active in these days than maybe ever before in history. And, um, and so the church, if we're going to rise up, we need, to, we need to know how to rise up and how to approach the challenge that's before us. I remind you that, um, that Paul says twice that we are to put on the full armor of God, which suggests to us that we cannot pick and choose, we cannot cherry pick those areas that, uh, that kind of scratch an itch for us, whether it's the belt or the breastplate or, or the, the, the shoes or whatever it is, the shield, the word. Uh, every one of them has their place and every one of them um, is important. In fact, they really feed off of one another and they're interconnected and you'll see that shortly. And I also want to remind you that we are literally not putting on armor, and obviously we're not. None of us here are standing, sitting around with helmets on and chest protectors and belts and shoes that uh, are are meant for warfare and battle. But what we're literally doing is clothing ourselves with Jesus. We're clothing ourselves with Him and His attributes and His character. We We are asking Jesus to not only fill us with His presence and to fill us with His character, but also to encompass us with who He is. And so when we put on these items, figuratively or spiritually, however we go about that, we're actually inviting Jesus to be truth in our lives. Uh, He is the truth. Amen? We invite Him to put His righteousness in us and on us and over us, for He is our righteousness. He is our salvation. We invite him to put on that salvation, that helmet, uh, because without him we are not saved. Amen? Cannot save yourselves. It is by faith that we come to him, and it is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and he is the original Word, and he is the Word, 
uh, the living word in our lives. Amen? And so we're literally clothing ourselves with Jesus, with his character. And um, one of the, another thing that's, that's said several times in this passage is this idea of standing or standing firm. And we've, we, we've talked about this a few times. Um, and we understand that the concept is staying in that place of, of, of victory. Uh, don't drift from the covering uh, or the place of security. Stay, dwell, camp at the foot of the cross. That's where we are already victorious, amen? Everything that we need, everything that, that brings us victory, everything that brings us hope, everything that brings us security, everything that brings healing and deliverance and all of those things happened at the cross of Jesus. And that is where we want to camp and that's where we want to live and that's, that's the place that we want to function from, amen? Uh, we're already victorious there. The devil has lost. He has no authority. And the authority, the divine authority of God that he, given, he, that he gave man originally has been reestablished. And the only thing he can do to the righteous believer is lie and deceive. We also want to uh, re um, reiterate the fact that everything that, uh, about this Christian journey that we're on uh, is initiated and uh, exists in the heavenly realms. And that's a hard phrase for us because we don't spend a lot of time and energy there. Why? Because we're human beings and we live according to our five senses. We, we like to believe in things that we see or hear or smell or taste or touch. And uh, more, than, uh, more than probably not, uh, we try to accomplish our, our goals and our concerns and our issues within the context of those five senses. And like Brenda said, try to work things out for ourselves. And so this Christian life is, in fact, initiated in heavenly realms because we know, according to Scripture, that we cannot even say yes to Jesus uh, if we are not drawn to him by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. So the fact that we are drawn to him or we're under conviction is a divine activity that's birthed in the heavenly realms. And so you cannot wake up one day and decide, well, I'm going to be a Christian today. Well, it doesn't work that way because, because if you made that decision and you feel compelled to do that, it's because the Holy Spirit is already working to draw you into that choice and that decision. Successful Christian living is empowered from the heavenly realms. It's, that's where our Lord sits at the right hand of the Father and intercedes and calls your, you, you out by name to the Father. And, and that's where he roosts for you and, 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 and speaks to the Father in your behalf. And so power and authority and strength and healing and deliverance and cleansing and purity and all of those things originate there and when it happens here, it's because it manifests itself from there to here in our lives. This idea of, of, um, of heavenly realm living uh, is, is a difficult concept. I, I grant you that. I, I, I try to fight through it when I'm walking the parking lot. Lord, help me to understand this because this is kind of out there in outer space to me. This is, this is a different concept. And, I, and I, it's hard for me to wrap my arms around it. But you see it over and over again. Once you begin to walk down that, that road, you begin to see that concept show up over and over again. I mean, think of, of the Lord's Prayer. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 10, he says, Your kingdom come, your will be done in heaven, um, on earth as it is in heaven. So what is, what is Jesus actually telling us how to pray here? He's telling us you need to pray that the things that are going on in heaven, those things that have already been established there, you need to pray that those things become established here on this earth. In fact, the translation really is a little more um, militant than this. If you, were to, if you were to read it properly from the, from the original Greek, it basically says something to this effect. Come, kingdom of God. Be done, will of God, right here on this earth as it is already done in heaven. Amen. And so what's established here, God has given us the right, in fact, the call to, to see that 
and ask him to, to bring that, manifest that self right here in our church, in our lives, in our family. And we also have to understand that deliverance is dictated in the heavenly realms. The timing, the, uh, the way that it, that it happens. And, and, and it's interesting here, I think I was talking to the, to the group Wednesday night, of how frustrating it is to deal with the idea of deliverance or uh, healing uh, from the scriptures because I'm a guy that likes patterns. I like to see things work on a regular basis where I can kind of tap into this and say, all right, this is how God works, and so we need to operate this way, we need to do this, we need to do that, because God responds to this and he responds to that. And if you read the Old Testament particularly in dealing with warfare and all of those things, it happens so differently each time. One point, somebody's waiting under the balsam trees, waiting for something to happen in the canopy. Another time, just stand there and watch what the Lord does. Another time, you know, uh, let's ambush them from behind and in front. I mean, there are so many different ways. There's hardly two ways that are similar on how God works. And the same thing is true uh, with, with, with healing, and, uh, and I just have come to the conclusion by faith that, that God does this almost on purpose so that we can't put a pattern to it and trust him and have to hear his voice to do what he wants to do when he wants to do it. And that's about relationship. You see, if we operate with, with uh, patterns and formulas, then we no longer need the relationship. We'll begin to worship and honor the formulas. And so God calls us into relationship, and, and, and this, this idea of deliverance uh, really is dictated in the heavenly realms. One of my favorite chapters, uh, I've said this probably several times already, and I, I probably have read this chapter 50 times over the last couple of months, Second Chronicles 20, verse 9, and it's interesting because I was reading it again yesterday, and what I'm about to say just jumped out at me just jumped out of me yesterday, having read this thing maybe 50 times. Chapter verse 9, if calamity comes upon us, this is Jehoshaphat praying, whether the sword of judgment or, or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress and you will hear us and save us. Now why do I read that scripture? Because I equate the idea of living in the heavenly realms while we walk on this earth and the same level as, as the idea of living in his presence, walking in his presence, basking in his presence, walking in his footsteps. To me, they're almost synonymous, if not completely. The presence of God, living in his presence, loving him, basking, hungering, fighting for his presence. And here we have a people who are under siege. They're already at En Gedi, and they're waiting to really wage war. And Jeho Jehoshaphat goes to prayer, and then he says, he drops this phrase in here, and I looked at that yesterday and said, why did I not see that before? He said, we will stand in your presence. <laughs> wow. You know, I'm going to have to, get a new Bible because I'm going to have to go back and maybe highlight things that didn't hit me because the whole Bible, the whole chapter is highlighted and underlined and, and, and it may be the most incredible chapter in the history of the world. At least for me it is right now. But the thing is, is, is his presence. His presence is where, where freedom is and deliverance and victory. That's where it's at. If they're not going to stand in his presence, these people are going to overrun them. And he says a little bit later, this army's too big for us. We can't handle this. We need you. And God gives them their marching orders, and they go down, and they just, they just set up. Where they, they go to their posts and just stand there and watch God go to war for them. It was, it's all tied to his presence. It's all tied to this idea that, yes, we walk here on this earth. I see, I hear, I smell, I taste, I touch, 
uh, we operate with the five senses. I understand that. But the reality is, if we're going to live successfully in this Christian journey, we got to get our mind in the heavenly realms. we got to get our passions and our desires in the heavenly realms. And we need to begin to operate with divine authority here in this earth. And then another one was um, Psalm 23. And somewhere down the line, uh, I'm going I'm to be doing a little series on this as well. Another chapter that's impacted my life in recent months. And right in the middle, it says, we find these words, Even though I walk through the, sh- the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And, and the thing is, is what we would like to focus on is, is, is this valley. And we know that, that this valley was probably uh, famous for, for the danger that existed there. This valley was evidently deep and so deep that the sun barely shone on the, on the, on the floor of the, of the canyon. And so it was dark. It was, it was dangerous. And here these sheep are traveling through this valley with danger all around them. Can you imagine the wolves and the lions and the bears? Man, there's a smorgasbord right there. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna check this out. But can you imagine those sheep banding close together? Which is what should happen when there's danger. Close the ranks. Close the ranks. And the scripture says that they walk through the valley. It doesn't say they camp. It doesn't say they hesitate. It doesn't say they wait. We don't want you to draw, uh, you know, drive any stakes down here. This is a valley that you need to walk through to get on the other side because there's blessings on the other side. We want you to keep moving. We want you to keep going. We don't want you to stay here. This is not, that's not your ending place. It's not your resting place because there is no rest here. We want you to keep moving. But how do the sheep move? It's dark. They're challenged geographically. (laughs) What do they do? They know the shepherd. And they follow the shepherd. They stay within close proximity of the shepherd. And the shepherd is the one that protects them from all of the dangers around them. The shepherd is the one that gets them through the valley and moves them to the other side. And so they stay within close proximity of the shepherd where they not only know he is there and feel his presence, but they see him. And as they stay close to the shepherd, they navigate a dangerous situation successfully and eventually get to the other side. So we're talking about the presence of God, even in the valley of the shadow of death. This is his presence it's his presence, it's his presence. And I'm not talking about his presence here on Sunday morning. I'm talking about where you work. You know what, folks? I dealt with this a little bit last week. Too many of us are kingdom jumpers. We go back and forth from one kingdom to the next. We're over here, we're, we're in God's kingdom over here trying to do right and, and trying to live right. We're at church, we're in Sunday school, we're with our church people, and so we're in this kingdom. And then we go to work, or we go to our social situations, or we go to the movies or wherever, we jump kingdoms. That doesn't work. Choose a kingdom. <laughs> Preferably the right one. Amen? Preferably the right one. And so... The presence of God, not only at church, not only in your devotions, but when you work, when you're on the highway, when you're at a meal, when you're with your family, when you're at a, at a ball game. The presence of God. Now, I want us also to note that both of the first garments are for defensive purposes. Both of them. And we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna, Flesh that out here in just a minute. Both of them are for defensive purposes. And you remember what we dealt with in terms of truth last week? We talked about uh, how truth has to be pursued. You don't just put a Bible under your pillow and sleep on it, and all of a sudden you've got truth. You know, it's just kind of there. Um, you don't listen to podcasts and come and hear outstanding sermons at the crossing every single week or go to a a really deep exegetical Bible study in Dave's class. You know, those things, you know, I mean, they're good, 
or even reading the Bible and having some intellectual understanding. But truth has to be pursued. There has to be a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. There has to be a drive to know what truth is. And once we know what truth is, truth has to be internalized. It's got to go from here to here. It's got to, it's got to enter into the fabric of who we are, into our DNA. And the truth has to be revealed in our living. If, if, if we can get truth here first and then move, move truth from here to here, it ought to be reflected in, in our worldview and how we approach life. Amen? And so in embracing, in embracing truth, now we're talking about warfare here. What's the practical idea here of the, of the um, armor of God? You remember last week we put on the belt, all right? And, and, and the idea of, of putting on truth and internalizing truth and living truth. Remember what we said last week, it, it has more to do with living out truth than it does exp- of having truth, right? All right, so embrace, in embracing truth, we cancel out one of his weapons. What is one of his weapons? Lies, deception, misdirection. And you remember the illustration about the counterfeit bills. You know what a counterfeit bill looks like because you know what the real thing is. And once you know what the real thing is, you can spot the counterfeit. And so one of the, one of the battle plans here is for God to show this is the real deal. I am truth. I am real. This is genuine truth. And then when the lies and the deceptions come your way, even when they're sprinkled with a little bit of truth, you can spot it. Amen. And so it's a defensive mechanism to help us to spot this deception and these lies. You know, he's the father of lies. In fact, the scripture tells us that lying is his native tongue. It's his native language. That's what he does. And so embracing truth, we cancel out that weapon of deception. And embracing righteousness, (laughs) sorry about that. (laughs) And embracing righteousness, (laughs) <laughs> uh, we're going to have to go out for steak today <laughs> watch some football <laughs> that, now that's what you're going to remember today all this other stuff you're not going to remember that but you're going to remember the squeak in embracing righteousness we cancel out his accusations all right? So you see the defensive mechanism here, because who is the devil? He is the great accuser. The scripture tells us night and day he's accusing you, he's accusing me. And the kicker is, much of the accusations have to do with our past failures, and too often we put on those grave clothes and hang on to them for a while. We've been forgiven, we are, we've been declared uh, innocent in the throne room of God, and yet we keep the grave clothes on because we feel so guilty about what we've done. And those accusations come before the Lord. It comes before us. He accuses us in our spirits. You're no good. You're this. You're that. Look what you've done. Look who you were. Look who you hurt. And so he is the great accuser. But to, to combat that, we live righteously where there is no actual accusation. Now, the breastplate is actual armor designed to protect vital organs, primarily the heart. We know that the, the belt of truth was, was not really armor. It didn't really protect anything. We know that the, the belt of truth or the, the belt um, um, in the armor uh, was designed to uh, connect the armor together. The breastplate would be connected to the belt. And um, it was designed to give, us, give strength in the, in the core area of the body so there's a little bit of, of power in that torso movement. It also provided um, a place to tuck the long flowing robes, giving us freedom, giving freedom of movement. So when the soldier went out to fight, or the athlete went out to run, or the, the farmer went out to farm, they could tuck those things into the belt and actually move freely without tripping or having any kind of danger or issue there. And so that's what the belt was designed to do. Core strength, tying everything together and, 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 and tying up loose ends so there would be flow and freedom of movement with, with, our, with our legs. 
um, but it didn't offer any kind of protection. It wasn't going to repel darts or swords or anything like that. But it did serve its purpose, and interestingly enough, it's the first thing that you put on because everything else connects to it. And, and really, the, the reality here is, it is truth that is our foundation, that everything else connects to. Amen. And so this breastplate was connected to the belt, and it was designed to protect the vital organs, primarily the heart. And you see it even today, military guys, uh, law enforcement people put on the um, bulletproof vest, and they're sure that it's going to cover the area in the upper chest where the heart uh, sits. Because the heart, if the heart is safe, even if they are wounded, there's a chance. But if it's the heart, there's no chance. You see, it's the heart that pumps life into those organs. It is the heart that brings life to every other part of the, the heart is the seat of your physical body. And the heart of the Christian, it's the spirit man, is the seat of their spiritual existence and their spiritual life. It keeps all, keep the, as the heart keeps all of the organs working properly by pumping blood to them. You think about it for a minute. Without the heart, you go brain dead. Without the heart, your kidneys don't function. Without the heart, your bladder, every part of your body, without the heart uh, pumping blood, uh, you'll notice, particularly if you're older, and, and many of us are getting there, and particularly if you have certain health issues, you begin to feel some issues in the lower regions of your legs sometimes, maybe, maybe um, uh, foot pain or what have you. The real issue there is blood flow to that part of your body. All right. If you have blood flow that's not happening in a certain part of your body, you create issues and maybe sometimes even death to that part of your body. So the blood that's pumped, but the blood is so interesting, isn't it? It's so complex and so beautiful. You, the blood is sent to every part of your body with oxygen and nutrients and healing principles and, and capabilities. The heart keeps everything flowing and moving properly. It's the heart that takes that blood and, and, and just nourishes every part of our body, brings vitality and vibrancy, proper functionality. And we're going to talk about how the spirit heart, the spiritual part, pumps righteous blood, his, his blood, into the different parts of our personality to bring healing and vibrancy as well. Now, righteousness has two forms, as does sin. Now, think about sin for a minute. We know that, that sin has two components. You have the, the, the sin that rests in our lives from, from the fall. Uh, we call it the Adamic nature or uh, original sin. Um, uh, it's there, um, it can be dealt with, and we'll talk about that later, but it's the disposition of sin, okay? And the disposition of sin, because of its presence, has to have an expression. And the expression is acts of sin, okay? Acts of sin. The expression of sin. Uh, if, 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 you, if, you, if you know someone doesn't know the Lord and, and they, they, they sin, it's because they are sinners. And that's why it's, it's so difficult for us as a church because we want to deal with people on our level who are not on our level. It's, 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 it's a faulty thinking to get someone to change their life and their lifestyle and their culture of who they are without changing their hearts. In fact, we're taught against that. It's by, it's, it's, we're saved by grace through faith. You can't save yourself. You can't adjust your life, your lifestyle, your culture. You are who you are. But not only is, is sin um, um, in two forms, but so, so also is righteousness. They've got the disposition of righteousness, which is the imputed or planted into our spirit. In other words, it's that righteousness that we receive through salvation where he plants himself into our spirits. Amen? And as a result of righteousness being 
disposed or, or planted in our hearts and our lives, because of that, then we become righteous people. And righteous people, just like sinners do sinful things, righteous people should act righteously. Amen? They should act righteously. It's the expression of righteousness that we see as a result of a disposition of righteousness. And so this disposition gives birth to active righteousness. And that's what we're talking about here. Active righteousness as a defense mechanism to the attacks of our adversary. Now let's look at how active righteousness defends us. Because it does. Active righteousness defends us. We are defended during temptation. We are defended during temptation. We put on the breastplate of righteousness so that we do not give an inch to Satan in the areas of impurity, lust, greed, or injustice. Realize who you are in Christ and live out that new identity in righteous living. Remember how I talked to you earlier about how these parts or these, these armor parts are interconnected. When temptation comes your way, the belt of truth speaks to our spirit and says, that's not right. That's not true. That's a lie. That's a deception. And so truth comes forth. And once truth comes forth, then we have, a, we have the ability to say, no, and we act our righteousness out in that situation and we walk away. Amen? We are defended against accusation. Satan is the accuser, but he cannot accuse the believer who's living a godly life in the power of the Spirit. The life we live either fortifies us against Satan's attacks or makes it easier for him to defeat us. And so we see how truth protects us against lies and deception. Righteousness protects us against accusation. We are defended against uninvited guests. Remember I told you a few weeks back, and I've told you a few times, that for the believer, Satan has no access to our lives unless we give him access. We can listen to the lie. We can listen to the deception. We can do that. Another way is we can open our lives up to, to sin, if we harbor sin, if we do sin, if, 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 we harbor our, if we have resentment in our lives, hatred in our lives, if we open our minds up to things that we should not be seeing or participating in, even occultic activities, things like pornography. Let me tell you something. Um, what does pornography do? It, 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 it invites a spirit of lust and degradation. All right? So, so these kind of things open the doors and the windows to to uninvited guests, so to speak. Now, uh, I'm going to ask your patient, uh, patience right up front, okay? Uh, I probably spent a little bit too much time in our review, and uh, I want to ask you to hang in here with me, okay? Can you do that? Thank you. When we were in Colorado, we lived in an apartment complex, and, um, and I had a job there as the building supervisor, which tells you what kind of shape the building was in. Why are you laughing at that? <laughs> My reputation precedes me. And um, one of the problems that we faced, and probably this is true in any multi-family uh, housing situation, uh, was roaches. Yeah, <laughs> I hear the moan, oh, roaches. All right? Now, the problem with roaches, and particularly in an apartment complex, is that everybody has to cooperate in order to correct the problem. All right, you can have 90% of the of the uh, the dwellers cooperate, but if 10% don't, you leave. The roaches are there, and they will multiply and they will re-infiltrate themselves into the other apartments. Now they weren't invited. Nobody put a sign out and said roaches welcome. All they needed was an environment conducive for them. Once the environment was there, they invited themselves. I can picture it now. Hey, there's a smorgasbord over at this apartment complex. Whether it's uncleanness or food left out or 
counters or tables not, not wiped down or, or crumbs on the floor. Any number of things are, are an invitation, a, a clarion call to all the Roche community, hey, there's a party going on. And they will come and they will infest and they will take over if you don't deal with them. Now, as part of my job for the, as, as, a, as a, the manager of the building was to try to eradicate this problem. <laughs> now, part of that was kind of fun. But the process meant that every single person in the complex had to empty out their closets, their cupboards, everything their, that, you know, where their eggs may be or where they may be kind of harboring, and then spray down every part of, of the complex. The problem was not everyone cooperated, like I said earlier. And so those of us that did, we may have a respite of a few days where they're not going to come around, but eventually... It comes back around, and that's really a commentary on sin. If you leave sin in every part of your life, any part of your lives, it's going to filter into other areas. So you've got to deal with it. Amen? Um, but see, the, one of the ways that I tried to handle this was try to manage the situation. And so I would be up at night, and Brenda would be in bed, and I thought, I'm going to take care of these roaches. And I don't know why I was just infatuated with the idea, I'm going to beat these guys. And so I would put some syrup or something on a countertop and turn a light off. And I'd just kind of wait for a little bit. And I'd have my can of, my, you know, my, my holster with my, my, my raid. <laughs> so I, so I'm ready. I'm ready. And then I'd turn the light on, and there was this army of roaches around this sugar or whatever I put on the countertop. And I'd, shh, shh, get them all. I want to kill these roaches. They don't bother me again. But what I didn't factor in is they had just laid thousands of eggs in the the cupboards or in the walls or in the next apartment and the problem was still there. I just took care of a symptom. Amen. The environment was the invitation for the roaches. Uncleanness, food, what have you. It is the environment that is the invitation to our enemy and his demonic horde. The enemy takes every opportunity to push his way into our experience. And unrighteousness is all the invitation he needs to send his demons on assignment. It not only leaves the door open, but rolls out the welcome mat on the doorstep of your soul. It actually attracts enemy intrusion in our lives, allowing him to make himself at home, set up camp. So rather than manage or cover up, uh, uh, why not clean up? Rather than, rather than trying to destroy the roaches that are around the sugar pile, why not get rid of the sugar pile and the syrup, clean up the counter, clean up everything, so there's no place for them to come and feed? Rather than manage our sin and try to cover up, you know how it is sometimes when your house is a mess and somebody calls and says, hey, we're on our way, you just throw things in the closet, under the bed, you know, so it has, you have the appearance that you're clean and orderly. Why not just be clean and orderly? Why manage our, our, our uncleanness? Why manage our sin? Uh, just, a, 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 just another quick story that I've told here before, but there's, it's been a while and there's enough new people here that you ought to be pleasantly disgusted by this like the rest of them have been. When I was younger, I worked with my dad on houses, and, um, and he was partners with, with um, a, a cousin and they built houses together, and my cousin's son, who was my cousin, and myself were drafted to work on these houses. We didn't, we didn't pursue this job, nor did we want this job, <laughs> but uh, we were drafted. And my dad worked in the mill shift work, and he worked sometimes the 3 to 11 shift where he had to leave the, the construction site at 2 to go to work. Um, and he would give us assignments to do while he was gone. You know, nail off the floor, nail off the roof, do what you need to do, clean up around here, roll up the, the, the cords. And so one day, and it was a hot day, and, and, and there aren't many 90-degree days in Indiana, but this was a hot day, and we were tired, we were sweaty, and uh, uh, sawdust sticking all over our bodies, and, and so it was time to leave, and we're rolling up those extension cords and putting tools away and doing all that. And I noticed my cousin out by the car, and uh, he takes his shirt off, and he grabs a towel from the back seat of the car, and he begins to wipe his head off and his arms and chest and over his back, and he takes a, 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 um, a deodorant and puts it on. 
and I'm standing there watching this because you know how I am, all right? And I'm watching this and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of disgusted by this. And I said, Ricky, what are you doing? Where are you going? He said, oh, I got a date. <laughs> and I thought, lucky girl. <laughs> lucky girl. Now, I didn't go on this date with him. <laughs> But I can assure you, it wasn't real long into the date that the deodorant no longer worked. The cover-up did no longer work. The clean shirt no longer worked. And the stench of who Ricky is and was showed itself. You see, for him, he chose to walk in his filth. He tried to cover it up, wipe it off, put a clean shirt on, put deodorant on. And how many of us do that in our homes? There's a stench in the air. Pull out the air freshener, spray it around, light a candle, cover it up. Some of you have done this. That's why you're laughing. (laughs) But he should have taken the initiative to clean. And if there's something going on in your house that you need a candle for, find out what it is and take care of that. You can still burn the candle, but you don't need the candle. So cleanliness, purity, righteousness. And by the way, this idea of sin, you know, when we think of sin, what do we think about? We think about acts of sin. We think of adultery. We think of immorality. We think of murder. We think of stealing. We think of lying. We think of all of these things. But James adds a little caveat to this when he says in chapter 4, verse 17, the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it sins. So I'm here to tell you, church, and I'm going to take a minute to talk to you about this. If God has put upon your heart to, to uh, man a ministry in his kingdom, in his church, and you say no because you don't have the time, you don't have the energy, you don't have, the, you don't have whatever it is you think you don't have, and you say no to that, you are as much in sin as somebody cheating on their spouse. Wow, you got quiet on that. I didn't hear any amens on that one. Amen? And whether it's in the church or helping a brother or sending a, uh, an encouraging note or, or giving somebody some money because they're in need or hurting, or maybe you're here today and, and God is talking to you about tithing or giving and you put it off because you're in debt, you can't do this, you can't do that, well, get out of debt and take care of business. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> Trash in your home invites undesirables. Unconfessed sin in your lives is an open door to demonic activity, if not infestation. So righteousness is the cure to that. And I want to just tell you, the scriptures are replete with the concept of purity and cleanliness and righteousness and purity. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Psalm 51, 2, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Psalm 51, 10, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And I could go on and on and on and on from Genesis to Revelation, purity, cleanliness, walking away from immorality, walking away from sin, walking away from gossip and slander and all of the, all of the sins of the tongue. getting carried away here now two things happen in spiritual warfare when the breastplate of righteousness is not worn first is an an invitation is sent out to allow demons to hang out in your life you don't want that I don't want that second the movement of God is hindered within and through you because there is a break in your fellowship with God God does not abide with, um, with and in darkness amen he is light no darkness in him at all. Righteousness includes more than right behavior. Righteousness includes the motivation behind doing, the, doing right behavior or doing wrong behavior. In fact, a person can literally do the right thing and yet contaminate it with wrong motivation. Maybe the motivation is pride or, or a form of right self-righteousness or, or maybe we're trying to treat God like a genie and if we'll do things a certain way, he'll respond and do things for me. 
or maybe the motivation is fear, knowing that, that doing the wrong thing will lead to severe consequences. In holiness, we are called to do the right thing for the right reason. Doing the right thing for the right reason is because we love God so much that we don't want to disappoint Him, we don't want to hurt Him, and so we're not going to cross over the line to represent Him poorly. You're kind of losing your steam and your enthusiasm here. Keep in mind, I'm, I'm just going to bypass this a little bit here. We're talking about the body, the soul, and the spirit, and how the body is obviously the body, the soul is, is that which makes us who we are. You know, I am not, this, this shell is not Steve Katuza's. It's, it's what's inside of me where, where my personality lies, where, where my thought processes are, my priorities. That's part of the soul. And then the spirit is that part that connects with God's spirit for redemption and restoration. And so what we want to do, and I'm kind of speaking off the cuff here a little bit to move this thing along a a little bit, is that that the goal here is that when we receive new life in Christ in our spirit, that the spirit acts like, like the heart and it pumps righteousness into our soul so that eventually my spirit, my my. My mind is sanctified. My, my uh, personality becomes sanctified. You know, I've heard more, so many people say, well, that's just who I am, you know, when they're harsh and they're critical, what have you. Well, quit being who you are and allow the Spirit of God to, to pop righteousness into your soul so that who you are represents better, him better than who you are now. Amen. That'll preach. One of the reasons... We are not experiencing victory in spiritual warfare is that we're, we're trying to force on ourselves a man-made breastplate of righteousness rather than sub- submitting to and accepting or receiving God's truth as the standard of righteousness he wants us to wear. In other words, your righteousness isn't good enough for me. Mine's not good enough for you. I don't care what TV preacher, what author, what Bible study leader you tend to to follow. It doesn't matter who it is. Their righteousness falls well short of God's plan for you. So the, the righteousness that I'm talking about here is God's righteousness, not the church's, not yours, not mine or anyone else's. We have to put on His righteousness and do things His way. Amen. All right, takeaways. You're probably getting hungry by now. Restaurants are, are, check, are, are starting to call out. Where's, where's the crossing? <laughs> wow. Takeaways. Continue to embrace truth, both the word and in our actions. All right? That combats the, uh, the lies and the deception and all those things. Number two, embrace his righteousness, not your own or others. Embrace his righteousness. And finally, exemplify righteousness in our choices, our attitudes, our priorities, in all of our life. Now, now I want to remind you as a closing thing here is is these first two are defensive in nature. But the first two also are not the the propensity or the, uh, the noun truth or the noun righteousness, but they're both the active part of that. You are a participant in truth. Truth is, is being lived out in your life and it breeds over and crosses over to living righteously. You may be righteous, but that righteousness has to come out and, and we live righteous both on what we do and what we choose not to do and we cut the legs off of the adversary because he no longer has accusation and he no longer can sneak a, a lie past us. Amen? Amen. Those are some practical stuff there, aren't there? Isn't there? Should be there. Let's just get out of this right now because I'm never going to get it right. Praise God. Spiritual warfare. It's real. There is, a, there is a devil that wants to take you out, take your family out, and wants to take this church out. All right? If we live in truth, walk in truth, and we live righteously, we can withstand those attacks. And we can live life abundantly. Amen? We don't need to be afraid. Embrace truth. Live righteously. Enjoy life, enjoy your family, enjoy your friends, enjoy worship. He's still going to be there. He's not going away. But we have victory at the foot of the cross. Amen. Let's stand together.